While this run has been on my mind for a while after being suggested a few months ago, it was not actually my first idea for this week's video. In fact, it was the fourth. First, I was going to do a Pokemon video to coincide with the release of the new games, but unfortunately, unforeseen emulator issues have put that challenge on hold. Next, I attempted to run beating Fallout New Vegas while the entire game world was underwater. New Vegas being New Vegas, it kept crashing any time I tried to leave the vicinity of Good Springs. Finally, I thought about getting around to beating Fable 3 at level 1, but then I realised I didn't have the game installed, and given everything else, I could just not be bothered to do that today. So that leaves us with All Reliable, the weapon restricted run, as we figure out, can you beat Skyrim with only a shiv? In a world where dragons are currently terrorising the airspace and people can freeze you to death with their chilly fingers, it probably comes as no surprise that the tiny half-assed sharpened piece of metal is one of the worst weapons in the game. Its base damage of 5 ranks it in the top 5 weakest weapons, with its only real advantage being its speed and low carry weight. Taking what I learnt in the Big the Cat run when you're presented with a weak one-handed weapon, the best strategy is usually to dual wield where possible to make up for the lack of real damage by effectively doubling your damage output. Now, with all that out of the way, let's begin. There is no question what race to choose this time. The instant I even thought about recording this, I knew I was going to be playing as an orc. Why? Berserker Rage, that's why. The power lets you, once per day, do double damage and take half damage for one minute. While that may not sound like a lot in the grand scheme of things, we all know how tanky Aldwin can be during his first fight atop High Hrothgar, so I want to make sure I'm as prepared as possible. Plus, my ill-fated wooden sword run, which I recorded and got corrupted two years ago, used a similar build, and I remember it worked quite well when I got to grip encounters. I call him Goblet as he do be looking like a little goblin, and after sitting through the first unskippable cutscene of many, begin to sprint through the burning, crumbling city like a madman, which is probably a fair reaction to what's going on. As per usual in runs like this where I cannot attack for the time, I just wait around until Railoff has dealt with the Imperial Captain, and once she drops dead, I grab the key for the door, and from there I start running and never look back. Outside, I make a beeline for the Warrior Stone as the 20% increase to one-handed experience seemed almost mandatory as I would want as many perks from that skill tree as I can get. In Riverwood, I sell what items I could to Alvor, so that when I make it to Whiterun in two minutes, I have enough gold to pay for the ride to Markarth. Demonstrating my right as a good citizen, I choose to be nice to Waylon and let him go about his daily affairs as he sees fit. This also allows me to search both him and Margaret for valuables, which I am sure will come in handy as I figure money may be quite important for resources like health potions and armour. As I am currently standing around doing nothing, I opt to work with Eltrees to get to the bottom of the Forsworn Conspiracy. To get the Shiv, I do need to be thrown into Sidna Mine, which I can either do naturally by just committing a crime inside of a guard and agreeing to submit, or by continuing to clumbo my way through the affairs of my betters around town. Well, the latter option is by far more interesting, so that's what I'm going to do. You may be questioning my detective skills, as every time I've been told to do some investigating, it usually ends up in a bloodbath in one of the casinos. Well, this isn't New Vegas, and since I still don't have my shiv, the townspeople of Markarth live to see another day. At least for now. I visit the inn first, like any good fantasy character, which leads me to the room of the woman who acted as a pretty effective sheath for Wayland's dagger, Turns out she was working for the Empire, and as such, the plot thickens. I am then threatened by the guards, before I snoop around Wayland's dirt hole as well. This leads to an encounter with Dryston, who is very intent on using me as his personal punching bag. I thought I'd run into a snag with a quest at this stage, as I might need to win against him in a brawl to proceed. Well, that's not the case it seems, as you can just run away from him and continue to speak with the rest of the people you need to to investigate for the quest, and after a while, and a few punches to the back of my skull, he decided to leave me alone. I'll just skip to the end of the quest as it's all just talking with various people, and truthfully, what they have to say is not important to the run, and really just served as a way to get us inside the mine, and start the real quest for the shiv. Other than mining somebody's skull for brain matter, the only way to get a shiv is by procuring a bottle of skooma for Grisvar, which I can do by ruffling around the pockets of Duak. Gotta love all these names I am more than likely butchering. Speaking of getting butchered, that's exactly what happened to me when I thought my shiv would be more than enough to outshiv my opponents, and I was dead wrong. In retrospect, if I'd made use of Berserker Rage, I may have been able to take down a few of them, especially if I focused on the one slinging spells my way. No matter, next life I just play along, and after handing my shiv over to Borkle, I can meet with the head of the Forsworn and get down to business. He wants me to murder the man who just gave me the shiv, which is fine by me, as the King of the Forsworn gives me another shiv, which allows me to get to jump on Grisvar and kill him before he knows what's happening. He also, fortunately, drops two more shivs. While I cannot try wield weapons, for as cool and bizarre as that would be, I can at the very least make use of my other hand, and now have access to maximum shiving potential. Ironically, even though I now have two shivs, 
I don't even use them for the rest of the quest, as we just casually leave the mine via a secret exit. For my troubles, Madna gifts me the armour of the old gods, quite the improvement for my prison rags, so for now it's my go-to armour set. I can't really make use of most of its enchantments though, so I'll more than likely switch it out down the line. Madanak promises that I won't be wanted by the people of Markarth, which is fantastic, as it means once we're back out in the city, him and the Forsworn will be hostile to the guards, whereas I am seen as some innocent bystander who is about to make a killing off of all the guards' armour and weapons. With some money, new armour and finally a weapon, it was time to get things moving, but before I made my way to Bleak Falls Barrow, like some sort of twisted compulsion, I am drawn to Ember Shard Mine to clear out the bandits there. As they are entry level bandits and I am still very much level 1, I am able to get by without too much hassle. That said, it's very clear to see even from this encounter that the shiv's low damage is causing what would normally be a 5 second fight to last nearly 3 times as long. That may not sound like much, but if it wasn't for my Forsworn Armour's decent defence rating, they would more than likely have killed me here as they brought me down to half health. One good thing to note is that this slaughter gets me enough skill points that I'm able to reach level 2, and to nobody's surprise, I take the first rank in the Armsman perk for 20% more one handed damage, bumping the shivs up from 5 to 6 damage per hit. Is it a big increase? Hell no but it's about as good as it's gonna get for now, so it was up the mountain to Bleak Falls and time to present every bandit and drugger I came across the prison shank treatment. Once more, all the stabbing increases my overall level, and you guessed it, one more rank in the armsman perk for another single point of damage. While levelling up is of course something I want to do, as it's the only way I'll be able to upgrade my damage, with each level I also increase the strength of the enemies I may encounter, which honestly could end up being much worse. The wounded frostbite spider ended up causing the most trouble, as its poison was just draining my limited health pool within seconds, to be fair, it was my fault for attempting a frontal assault. After backing through the doorway and healing up, I returned and used the oldest trick in the book, which of course is slashing away at him whilst slowly circling him just out of reach. This works, and before long I am putting my years of metal gear to good use, as I am able to sneak up on the Draugr for some critical hits to help speed up the fight. I tried this on the Overlord at the end, but he wasn't having any of it, so I had to resort to just combating him normally. It goes better than expected, mainly thanks to him not being overly aggressive and allowing me to land multiple dual power attacks that just shred his health bar, or at least what amounts to shredding by Shiv standards. Anyway, I grabbed the Dragon Stone along with all the valuables in the nearby chest, and because I enjoy the look of virtual money, I returned the claw to Lucan, and then used said money to purchase a leather backpack to hide my shivs in. When I make it to White Run, it's straight to Dragon's Reach to hand over the stone and rip this long overdue bandaid off as I go to face down my first dragon. In a rare moment of nerbit tactical thinking, I used Farangar's enchanting table to break down some of the items I got in Bleak Falls, knowing full well that the experience gains would push me to level 5, and then I just kept that level up there as an instant full restore should I need it during the dragon fight. I cannot attack the dragon while he is flying of course, but as soon as he lands, the Berserker Rage is activated and I rush him down with a single shiv. The idea was that with only one equipped I could stagger him with a well-timed block attack to negate as much damage as possible. Ultimately, as you can see, I decided against this and began dual wielding again simply because I noticed just how little damage I was taking thanks to Berserker Rage and realised that with a DPS of two shivs, I should be able to power through and bring him down. Granted, let's not act like I did all the work, the multiple white run guards present along with Aerolith did a lot of damage as well, so it was a team effort. Problem is, I'm going to be that one guy from every group project and take credit for the whole thing when I make it back to the Jarl. Next up, it's the journey to High Hrothgar to become integrated into the Old Man's Screaming Club. On the way, I agree to help out Amran retrieve his father's sword, because in doing so, I can get a free one-handed level, which is most appreciated. Also, just so I don't have to show it over and over again, pretty much all of my money from here until I reached level 50 and one-handed went straight into this man's pockets as I paid for lessons. For once, the sword isn't located at the nearby bandit-ridden towers, but rather, it's at the nearby bandit-ridden cave. I promise it's completely different. Some of you may have noticed that the left shiv is glowing purple, well that is because I enchanted it to steal souls. The reason is actually the first step in a bigger plan to make these shivs more viable. Don't worry, I am not about to use the alchemy restoration exploit, to me that kind of ruins any of the fun. Rather, I am just going to be applying some base level enchantments on the weapons later, but before that I want to fill up some soul gems, as no doubt the charges in them will run out fast. You may have already noticed the attack speed increase. Well, shivs are already classed as daggers, making them the fastest melee weapons, but now, thanks to the dual flurry perk, they are even faster. This allows me to cut through the bandits in the cave without a care in the world. Magic users can still be a problem, but for now my best strategy against them is to just not get hit. I know, who would have thought it would be that simple? The bandits leader, Iron Hand, is a fraud. I see those gauntlets, not only are they steel, but they don't even cover your hands. For this treachery and namesake, I shivved the Venom Iron Hand to death, and then returned Amran's sword to him for that free level. 
Despite the fact I had no reason to, I still decided to make my way down to the towers just to murder the bandits anyway, and this ended up being a worthwhile decision in the long run. While I have been wearing light armour up until this point, that was about to change whenever I noticed that the bandit leader was wearing a full set of steel soldier armour. For anyone who hasn't played Skyrim in a while, this is one of the new armour variants added by the Anniversary Edition. Don't worry, it's not some piece of armour that has eluded you for the past 11 years. It's a rather close battle, what with his better armour and weapons, the only reason I'm able to come out victorious is due to my speed advantage and having the sense to stock up on some health potions before coming here. Even though I already have a few perk points in the light armour tree, the steel soldier set still offers better protection, so there is no question about which set I would rather wear. Feeling pretty good about just taking out two bandit chiefs back to back with very little issues with all things considered, I decided it was time to see just how much damage I could do against a giant. Immediately humbled, I followed the path to Iverstead, only stopping twice. First time to murder some Imperials taking a Stormcloak soldier prisoner. I may not be siding with the Stormcloaks or Imperials today, but it always seems to rustle people's jimmies when I support the Stormcloaks, and that is funny to me. I never even got a chance to share my supplies with the prisoner, as he was off like a rocket the instant he saw an opening. The second time I stopped was the Skyrim Classic, because I was attacked by a dragon. I was literally saving my Berserker Rage just in case something like this happened, so at the very least, I was prepared. I also had a single fire resistance potion, which helped out immensely. I thought that the dragon was going to be smart and just fly around and attack me out of reach, but I seemed to have got him stuck on a loop where he would land, we would then fight for a bit, and then when he took off I walked a bit down the road where he would circle back and land back in his original spot. I did this a couple of times until he was too injured to fly, and from there it was easy pickings as I hacked away at the last of his health bar. I even managed to get the killing blow animation on him as well, which just looks incredibly funny, watching this heavily clad orc brutally stab a mythical lizard with what is essentially a razor blade glued to the end of a toothbrush. After I made Iverstead, I actually decided to head back to Riverwood briefly and abuse my power as Thane to steal some steel from Alvor and use it to ever so slightly increase the armour rating of my armour. I then waved my title around to ignore the charges and it was right back to scaling the mountain after I became mesmerised by this never ending spinning wheel. Normally I make a big deal about taking out the Frost Troll on the way up to High Hrothgar, mainly because he has caused me so many problems in the past when fighting him. This time though, the sheer speed at which I can slash with the Shiv is so fast that it's far too easy to just get in a few slashes and then back off without any issues. Sure, the damage is still low, but it's basically death via a thousand cuts, which I am more than okay with. From here I make it into High Hrothgar, and we all know how the Greybeard's training goes by now. We walk in, scream at them, and then repeatedly run into them at full speed to skip their dialogue, until it's time to go to Ustengrav. Before that, I decided to let Klimek know that I delivered his supplies like the good Samaritan that I am. However, while I was waiting for him to exit his house, I was attacked by three hired thugs. They weren't very good at their jobs. They kind of just kept circling me and not attacking, so I just fought back and slowly welded them down until they were no more. Their gear was definitely worth selling for a quick profit, but better yet, one of them had an iron warhammer with a shock enchantment, which once broken down, would be perfect for the shivs. Out of Frost, Fire and Shock, Shock is easily the best for the main story, as you are mostly fighting Dragons and Draugr, which resist Fire and Frost respectively. But that can wait. You see, I read the contract on their bodies, and it appears they were sent by none other than Alvor, the Riverwood blacksmith. Well, it's my right to seek revenge, so that's exactly what I did. I waited until the town of Riverwood was cloaked with darkness, and after a night on the town, I jumped Alvor while he was on his way home, and gave him the good old shiv shiv shiv. The guards and townsfolk were not best pleased with this, but before they even knew it I was out of town and hitching a ride on the back of a nearby cart bound for Morthal. This meant my plans to use the Enchanter's Table and Dragon's Reach to upgrade my shivs would need to be put on hold for the time, but it wasn't a huge setback. I would just have to keep being careful for now, so when I made it to Ustengrav I had to carefully pick my fights rather than charge all the necromancers and undead bandits at once. Essentially, just going after the necromancers was the obvious play, as that would in turn take out all the bandits once their summoner was dead. The Draugr, however, are as easy as ever. That said, most of them have been upgraded to the Ruin Sleep Schedule variety, so now I have to contend with my stamina being drained, as well as my health, which is always welcome. After refusing to become Spider-Man, I am met with a note from Delphine, proving that this test for the Dragonborn is rigged, and that I should meet her in Riverwood. Nuts to that I say, and instead I venture on over to Winterhold, and then north from there to seek out Septimus Cygnus, and begin the grand quest for the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim Anniversary Edition trademarked. For once I decided to make a point to fight the Dremor Spiders and Falmer on the way to the scroll, as once again any increases to my one-handed skill are very appreciated at this point. Needless to say, it's not long before I grab the scroll and then have to trek back to Riverwood and deal with Delphine's presence. Joy of joys. First up, it's Skyrim 101, which of course means dragon slaying. 
Sadly for Salakunir, unlike every other dragon fight, he does not start in the air, but rather he crawls slowly out of the ground and must finish growing his skills back before he can fight. This means that as soon as his bones pop out of the ground, the Berserker power is activated and I turn into a spitting ball of stabbing death. By doing this, I'm able to get his health below half before he can do much of anything, making him permanently grounded, allowing me and Delphine, but mostly me, to finish him off in what is definitely the most embarrassing death for a dragon ever. Next up is the Embassy, and knowing I am about to come face to face with a bunch of magic users, I decided enough time had passed that I could enter Whiterun a free man and enchant my shivs. I purchased some Grand Soul Gems from Fire and Guard to enchant them to the best of my ability, which is zero perk points invested in the tree by the way. I'm able to give them 10 points of shock damage on top of the 10 base damage they're already doing, which is pretty good if I'm being honest. I named them Shock Shiv and the other Shock Shiv so I don't get them confused. You may marvel at my incredible naming conventions if you wish. I then witnessed a dog sit on a bench and I was off to the embassy. Using alcohol to my advantage to slip away unseen, I proceeded to test out the Shock Shivs on the Thalmor and, well, just look at them go. The damage is one thing, but the fact it will also drain them of magicka means they can't be as aggressive with their spells and that does put a smile on my face. I do still have some close calls, especially when I first enter the main building, simply due to how many of them are coming at me at once. I manage to persevere and get yet another dumb kill as I do the Anakin crossblade decapitation with these two pieces of metal. Anakin had sheaves to make him behead Count Dooku and I have shivs, so you can see the correlation I am sure. The rest of the embassy is a cakewalk from this point and seeing how I've already taken out the majority of the guards, I didn't even need to use my rage, so instead I decided to just use it on the frost troll and for once in my life save both Malborn and that random prisoner whose name I just forgot. Considering how smooth that just went, I decided to keep up the pace, and so it was off to Riften to find Esbern. Before entering the Ratway though, I did notice Yuvari from the embassy following me, as I forgot to deal with her while I was there. The fight, if you can call it that, is about as one side as you can imagine, and so I don't get charged with my second act of murder today, I made sure to hide her body in the river before ducking into the tunnels. The Madmen and Thalmor looking for Esbern get fried, as I still have plenty of shock charges left, once again allowing me to clear a path to and from the old man, which after your brief introduction, means we only have to take out a handful of elves before we are safely back on the surface. Once the two blades are reunited, I let them chat for a bit before dragging them off to Alduin's wall so we may push on with the plot. On the way, I was attacked by a random Breton. Or rather, I should say he tried to attack me as I appeared to briefly tap into Ultra Instinct as I effortlessly avoided all of his attacks and then used my sheer speed to quickly and efficiently win the battle. Feeling pretty good after that encounter, I decided to fight the Frost Dragon that attacks the Force War near Karspire. Except this time he was of the blood variety, not Frost. No matter, it's all the same to me, so as soon as he's dumb enough to land, it's combat time as me, Esbern and Delphine beat him long enough until he decides to give us his lunch money in the form of his soul. A few dead Forsworn here, a few slip palms there, and we make it into Alduin's Wall. While Esbern admires the walls and Delphine figures out how many blades it takes to light a torch, I head to the armory and make one final armor upgrade as I swap out my steel soldier set for some blades armor. While some of the pieces may not be as strong, when they're combined together with the well fitted perk, the blade set is just slightly better. Delphine is not best pleased at the fact that we need a shout to defeat Alduin, as that means once again enlisting the help of the Greybeards, who she seems to hate for a really stupid reason. Heading back to the Greybeards and I learn how to change the weather, and after slicing up some ice wraiths who were in the wrong place at the wrong time, I arrive at Parthenox. After some back and forth I read the scroll from earlier, and now it's time for what is always the most difficult fight in the run, the first Alduin battle. I came prepared this time though. I made sure I had some resistance potions, even though it wouldn't do me much good, as he will always just use whichever breath attack you're weakest to, and then from there I made sure my shifts were at full charge, along with Berserker's Rage being available. I slaughtered him. No two ways about it. The barrage of strikes was more than enough by now to make up for the lack of damage, and the shock on top of that, along with my rage, may have been overkill. To add insult to injury, right at the end of the fight my one handed increased to 60, allowing yet another rank in the armsman perk for, you guessed it, even more damage. I'm frankly shocked how simple that was. Anyway, the difficulty is on normal as per usual, but for some reason he was not as aggressive as he normally is. My only guess is that maybe he glitched out, because after all it is the Bethesda game, so it's entirely possible. No point complaining though, I should save that for what comes next, the aggravatingly boring peace council. Nothing to say, it's the same as ever, just waiting for the NPCs to be done yelling at one another so I can head down to Whiterun to insult the dragon so bad that it becomes my personal chauffeur to the stairway to heaven. I died once here and it was because I got a tad overzealous when I attempted to take on a dragon, backed up by Draugr reinforcements. Doesn't take a genius to figure out that was never going to work. Next try I take out the Draugr, but I just avoid the dragon. After all, no point wasting what's left of my weapon's charges before the final fight. 
At least that was my mindset until I got into the temple and finally remembered that the soul shiv was indeed a thing and began to just suck out the soul of every draugr in the building. With more than enough charges to see me through, it was into the portal and time to fight soon. I started the fight by getting a few cheap shots in while he was still talking. While dishonourable, it was entirely necessary. When I did manage to get his health low enough, he was one swing away from doing his rapid headbutt takedown. From there I meet up with the Warriors 3, or whatever, and it's back outside to face the final boss. As I have said many times, if you have gotten to this point, you've already won the run, because as far as I know, it is the same as the last Alduin fight, only this time you have three, potentially four, strong allies by your side, who Alduin always seems to focus without fail. Just like before, I just went straight for his face and started to shiv away, and surprise surprise, this worked. Before long, Alduin was failed in one of the most disrespectful ways possible, finishing the game and proving yes, you can indeed beat Skyrim with only a shiv. I am always up for a good weapon restricted run, as they can either be stupidly fun or horribly weak. This one honestly fell somewhere in the middle. While they were weak at the beginning, as soon as I got the dual flurry perk to increase their speed, they slowly began to become surprisingly formidable weapons. The other three videos I mentioned at the start will be made someday, whether one of them is next week's video remains to be seen, but who knows, anything could happen. Regardless, that's going to be the next challenge video. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider giving a video a like. If you're interested in more challenges in the future, feel free to subscribe to our videos every week. My name is Norbert, stay safe, and I'll see you all in the next video.